In this video we're going to look at what an allotrope is and specifically at the allotropes of carbon. So let's start by recalling some things about carbon. Uh, we know that it's in uh, group number four on the periodic table which means that it has four valence electrons. It's got six electrons overall. Uh, it's got intermediate electronegativity which means it forms covalent bonds and because it's got four valence electrons it generally forms four covalent bonds. Now since like charges repel, electrons in neighbouring bonds in a molecule like to be as far away from each other as possible. So molecules arrange themselves so that their bonds are positioned as far apart as possible. Uh, but for the case of carbon with four bonds, the way to arrange four bonds so that they are as far apart as possible is to put them in a tetrahedron. The simplest example of this structure is the methane molecule, one carbon bonded to four hydrogens arranged in a tetrahedron. This ball and stick model here shows you the 3D arrangement of the bonds more clearly. However, another way for carbon to distribute its four electrons is to form two single bonds and one double bond. For instance, in the compound ethene with two carbons and four hydrogens, the two carbons are joined by a double bond and each is then bonded to two extra hydrogens to make up its total of four bonds. In this configuration, with bonds to three different atoms, the best way for the bonds to be arranged is in a flat 2D arrangement called trigonal planar. You can see that each carbon is arranged in a sort of a triangular uh, arrangement, and it's also two-dimensional, so planar. And there's 120 degrees between the bonds. Uh, so this is what happens here in ethene, with each carbon atom having a trigonal planar arrangement. So if we compare these two, meth methane and ethene, you can see that carbon is able to form at least two different bond arrangements. And what's the significance of that? Well, methane and ethene are two different compounds. They're made up of more than one element, and they have different numbers of atoms making up their molecules. But what if we only use carbon atoms? Can we get different bonding then? The answer is yes, we can. And when you get different forms of the same element that have different bonding, we call them allotropes. Let's just recall that isotopes are different forms of the same element where the atoms have different numbers of neutrons. So don't get isotopes mixed up with allotropes. So two allotropes of the same element are made of the same kind of atom. For instance, two allotropes of carbon would both be made only of carbon atoms. But the different bonding arrangement makes a huge difference to their properties. So let's have a look at some of these. The Wikipedia page for carbon has a really nice graphic which illustrates the different bonding in a range of carbon allotropes. Uh, so the eight that they're showing here are diamond and graphite and lonsdaleite, which is a little bit like diamond but the arrangement of bonds has a slightly different symmetry. It's named after a famous British crystallographer, Kathleen Lonsdale. Uh, then we've got a variety of buckyballs with different numbers of carbon atoms involved. Uh, we've got amorphous carbon and we've got uh, bucky tubes, also known as carbon nanotubes. So let's explore these a bit more deeply. First of all, diamond. In diamond, each carbon atom forms single bonds to four other carbon atoms, and the four bonds are arranged in a tetrahedral geometry. This is just like the methane molecule, except that in methane, the carbon bonded to four hydrogen atoms. Since hydrogen atoms can only form one bond, they represent a dead end, but when a carbon atom bonds to another carbon atom, that second one can bond to another three atoms, and they can each bond to another three, and so on. As long as you have atoms, the molecule, or lattice, can keep on growing. So when many carbon atoms bond together in this formation, the result is a three-dimensional lattice held together by covalent bonds. We call this kind of covalent structure, one that can be extended in all directions like a lattice, covalent network bonding. This is what makes diamond so hard and so strong. A single diamond crystal is in effect a giant molecule, and in order to break it, you must break the covalent bonds between many carbon atoms. This is in contrast to, say, ice, which is made up of many separate water molecules. When you shatter an ice cube, you're merely separating the molecules from each other. You're not breaking the covalent bonds that hold the molecules together. Like most covalent compounds, diamond doesn't conduct electricity because the pairs, the electron pairs, are confined within the covalent bonds and they can't move through the compound. 
Recall the difference with conductive metals, which have the delocalized valence electrons that can move through the lattice of positive metal ions and thus conduct electricity. Graphite is another well-known allotrope of carbon and it has a more complex structure. The bonding in graphite is a bit like the bonding in ethene. Each carbon atom bonds to three other carbon atoms using two single bonds and one double bond. The result of this is a continuous lattice of flat hexagons with, an alterna with alternating single and double bonds. Each lattice is a flat single sheet, only one carbon atom thick. And each layer is quite strong for its thickness because like diamond it's held together by covalent bonds. These 2D sheets of carbon can stack on top of one another to form the grey solid that we're familiar with. But neighbouring sheets are stuck together only by very weak attractions called van der Waals forces. And we're going to explore these more in semester two as well. There are no covalent bonds that tie the separate sheets together, only these weak attractions. So this means that the sheets can be separated from each other quite easily. And this is exactly what happens when you drag the tip of a pencil across some paper. Sheets of graphite are sheared off from the main lump and stick to the paper. In addition, there's something else about this bonding arrangement that gives graphite special properties. The pattern of single and double bonds in graphite is not fixed, but can alternate, so that single becomes double and double becomes single. This means that the extra electrons that form these alternating single and double bonds are essentially able to move through the 2D lattice, and that means that graphite is conductive. Now I've just mentioned the fact that each individual layer in graphite is strong for its thickness. Well, some very interesting research found that it was possible to separate out a single sheet of graphite and study its properties. And it turns out that these properties, strength and conductivity and flexibility and so on, are pretty amazing, meaning that these single layers of graphite, which have been named graphene, are likely to form the basis for future applications such as new transistors, special coatings, sensors, uh, and support membranes to hold tiny samples in electron microscopes. Google graphene and you'll find it all over the place. So how do you separate a single molecular sheet from a lump of graphite? So how do you separate a single molecular sheet from a lump of graphite? Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoselov at the University of Manchester managed to do this during a series of fun Friday experiments that they were running using some highly advanced equipment, sticky tape. They pulled a thin layer of graphite off a larger lump using sticky tape and then with further bits of sticky tape they removed more and more graphite layers until they could see under a microscope that the graphite had become transparent. Perfecting this process they eventually obtained a single layer of graphite which they called graphene. This picture shows a scanning transmission electron micrograph of graphene with atomic resolution that's so good that you can see the carbon atoms do indeed form hexagons. And this picture, a scanning electron micrograph with at, uh, at a larger scale, here you can see a whole sheet of graphene folded like a piece of silk. For this work, which has led to a massive amount of research into the properties of this material, they received the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics, which means that Andre Geim is the only person to have won both a Nobel Prize and an Ig Nobel Prize, awarded to examples of research that, quote, make you laugh and then make you think. Geim won the Ig Nobel for Physics in 2000 for his research into levitating frogs, a study of the phenomenon of magnetic repulsion between diamagnetic materials and strong magnetic fields. Anyway, apart from graphite and diamond, there are still more allotropes of carbon. A number of them are versions of graphene, where the single sheet has been folded around to form balls or tubes. The most famous has the same arrangement of hexagons and pentagons in its structure as a soccer ball. These molecules are colloquially, colloquially known as buckyballs and bucky tubes, and are formally known as fullerenes. Interestingly, both of these names come from the name of Richard Buckminster Fuller, who was not a chemist, but was in fact an American architect who popularized the geodesic dome. And the people who first came up with the buckyballs uh, realized that the structure of the buckyball was somewhat like a geodesic dome. The last allotrope, and perhaps the one that's most important to all of us right now, is amorphous carbon, or as you might know it, coal or charcoal or soot. In this allotrope, the carbon atoms are joined together rather randomly, amorphously in fact, giving no long range structure. It's black and hard, but it's not particularly strong because the random arrangement of bonds means that they're not in the most stable configuration, which weakens the overall structure. 
So that's a brief run through the allotropes of carbon, but carbon's not the only element to be able to bond in different ways. The Wikipedia page on allotropes has an impressive list of different element forms. Some may be familiar to you, while others only exist under particular pressure or temperature conditions. For instance, oxygen forms the familiar O2 molecule, but it also forms ozone, O3. Sulfur is in the same group as oxygen, and it's able to form diatomic molecules like oxygen, S2, but its preferred form is actually in rings of eight sulfur atoms. Phosphorus takes a number of forms. The incredibly flammable white phosphorus is made of P4 molecules, where the atoms are bound in a tetrahedron. Compare this with the tetrahedron of methane, which has the central carbon atom, which then has the bonds radiating out to the four hydrogens, which form the vertices of the tetrahedron. In this one, the phosphorus atoms are at the vertices, and the bonds actually form the sides of the tetrahedron. This allotrope has a terrible history in its use in incendiary bombs in a number of wars because it's so reactive. In contrast, the relatively stable red phosphorus allotrope has largely amorphous bonding. Tin also has interesting allotropes. See what you can find out about tin pest and the trouble that it caused Napoleon's army when they tried to invade Russia. Well, that's enough for now. I'll see you in class.